you think of Carl and Kai from the Ocean Kai? It's just the right time. Welcome to the stage, everyone. Yeah. are for you. Change in a negative form the feeling that that brings up inside of you. Anxiety. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. Anyone else? Fear. Insecurity. What's your name, sorry? Douglas. Insecure. It's okay, Douglas. You're right behind you. Anyone else? Fear. Fear. Excellent. Yes. Fear. Anyone else? Worry. What do you feel about the people that are pushing for the change? Let's get to, to the seriousness, yeah? Stop mucking around. How do you feel about the people who are pushing change that makes you feel worried, anxious, fearful? Anyone? How do you feel about the people pushing change? Threatened. Perfect. Thank you. Anything else? Come on. Think about it. Anger. Yes. Another word? One more. One more. How did you feel about that person or, person or people? Anyone in the back got a word? I've got all many, honestly. Just one word. Resentful. That's the one. Thank you very much. Now we can move on. Here's your words. Just a couple more. But yeah. It's no money, is it? I want you guys to <coughs> pick a word that you relate to that describes the process when you're talking about change in a negative way. Pick one of those words and we'll come back to them later. For now, these two men are Gillis and Mackay. One is my dad, that's John Mackay, and the other is Grant Gillis, who is my uncle. They're the founding directors of Gillis and Mackay. We started the business back in 1989, when I was just three years old, and the going rate for stacking wood was a competitive one pence per length. I made a killing. It's a family business, and I've been there pretty much all my life. I started off as a woodcutter and labourer for on-site assembly. We make the best sheds in the world. That's what we do. Here I am with my guys, the lads, the boys, whatever you want to call them, in the workshop. This one here is a house project. We built up a house. Thought that was quite relevant considering that's what you guys are into. Yeah, so it was good times. It was a good point in my life where there's very little worry and I'm just sticking my music on, cutting woods, and enjoying life. That's all I had to do. It was great. But then when I got to about 18, the lady that was in the office was going on maternity leave for the very last time. She was gone, out, away. So the natural progression was for me to move into the office. Now I've been helping out weekends and stuff, so I was starting to get a bit of a feel for it. And I was actually at college studying uh, HNC in business. And I was about to start my HND, and this opportunity came up. So Saturday HND, went full on, office manager, bring me the sheds. Loved it. It was then that I started to realize how brilliant this company was. Because we didn't just make just your normal shabby shit shed. You know, we make the best sheds. 
out of the best timber, using the best materials, using the best processes with the best team. That's what we did. And it was then I remembered, Grant said to me, we don't have customers, Kat. We've got Raven fans. That's what we've got. And it's so true, the core, hardcore fan base that we have are our best customers. They're beautiful. But I didn't realize the full potential of this until I attended a marketing course, which is quite strange, because I just got out of university with my honors degree in business management, and I knew everything. Everything. All the marketing lingo, the seven P's I may bother, got it, sorted, it, A's, everything. So, sauntering in with an attitude, thinking I know everything. And we're about, I don't know, four or five classes in. And I get asked this question from the really irritating teacher. And he says, says something, and I say, well, don't want to be making shit for the rest of my life. Like, wrong attitude. God. Absolute wrong attitude. How am I supposed to sell shares if I don't want to be selling them? If I'm so ungrateful for what I do? I had to change my attitude, get a grip on myself, and realize the potential behind the company that I was effectively in charge of. So I love shares. Shared life, shedonism. Sheds are forever. And every one of you guys, you need a shed. If you don't have a shed, get one. If you've already got a shed, get another one. They're amazing. And it's at this workshop that I learned a specific thing that blew my mind. It was my light bulb moment. Everything just came together and I was like, this makes sense. Can anyone tell me what this number has to do with the way that people buy things today? Online. What online? Use it in a sentence. They just buy their products online, services online, just buying stuff online. Very close, it's close. Never had something get in the water. I thought you were going to be that person. <laughs> Is there anything else? Impulse buying. Impulse buying is 70%. Good, not cool. It's not right, but it's good. Anybody else? Research. Research. Who said that? <gasps> Rory. Jonathan, research. Hmm, clever. Have you been reading my slides? <gasps> you have been reading my slides! 70% of the buying decision is made online before customers make first contact. Okay? This is crucial. 70% of the buying decision is made online before they even know you exist. They're researching. We are in an age where consumers are obsessed with research. So whilst they are researching for the most crucial purchases in their life, like, I don't know, buying a house, and delving into the detail to get the answers to the questions that they need in order to make an educated buying decision, are you in that conversation? Are you part of it? Are you offering the answers that these people are looking for? Because this is what we call the zero moment of truth, or this is what Google calls it. So Google calls this area the zero moment of truth. And that's the pinpointing the exact moment as to when a customer becomes engaged. Now, if you are not producing the answers to the questions they're looking for, it's not that they don't know who you are. You're not even in the conversation. You're not on the table. There is no way that you have anything to do with this. So in order to be part of the conversation, in order to get on the table, you need to be answering some questions. I can't bother you that bad, actually. It's probably taking up too much time. The person who coined this idea of answering customers' questions, and we call it TIA, they ask, you answer. It's the motto, and this is the book. It's done by this guy, the legend, the god that is, Marcus Sheridan, be still my beating heart. He founded the principles of the Ask You Answer on a basis of five fundamental 
fees that you need to be covering when you're answering questions. And we call this the Big Five. That's his book, by the way, in case you want to buy his book. I don't get any affiliation from it. The Big Five. Price, cost, problems, versus comparisons, reviews, and best. Now, do these topics make sense to you? When you are thinking about buying something, are these topics relevant? Yeah? What do you think? Yeah. You want to know how much it costs, right? It's probably one of the most, most important questions you're going to ask. How much am I having to pay for whatever service or product you're after? Maybe it's a shed, I don't know. How much does a shed cost? Does anybody know? I know. Problems. What kind of problems do you come across when you're trying to make a purchase? What's the barriers? Is there things that you have to do first before you can buy something? For example, get a home for it. Versus and comparisons. This versus that. Wood versus metal. Plastic versus wood. Reviews. We all read reviews. How many of us use TripAdvisor? Hands? Yeah. You cannot wait to find out how Daphne and Dave got on in the hotel in Tenerife. And was it actually cava on tap or was it just water down line? That's what you want to know. These are important decisions. These are things that bring you happiness, bring you joy. Now, it's not just holidays. It's not just Amazon reviews. People are searching in Google for things like salt. What salt am I going to buy? Should I buy pink Himalayan salt? I don't know, maybe. 300% rise in people searching for salt in the last year on Google. Researching salt, it's just mad. Hiking salts, another one. Another mad statistic of people searching for stuff that they might need and really researching it before they buy. It's a £7.99 purchase, but God, you want to make sure they're right because if you get blisters halfway up that money, you're not going to be happy. Reviews are probably the most important and one that people tend to shy away from because it means that you, as a business, have to talk about your competition. And nobody likes that. Except for me. I write these blogs all the time. Best of. So the best of one, again, is competition-led. I'm speaking about what's available in your industry. Your customers are asking these questions. Okay, so they're wanting to know who the best is in the industry. They're going to Google it. And if you're not telling them, somebody else is. Price and cost. Here's one for you. How much does a large garden room cost? Now, this is a very fairly recent blog within the last sort of two months. It's already number two on Google. Search it, find it for yourself. There she is, number two. I don't pay for any of this. This is all organic. I haven't paid for advertising in a long time. Problems. This one is how to get rid of mold in your summer house. It's probably one of my most popular ones. Now, this is for the customers that we already have because you've got to look after them guys too. Versus in comparison, wood versus metal versus plastic. Fairly certain, fairly easy. Reviews. <sighs> I love this one. Does anybody know about interlocking log? No? Do you know what it is? Michael knows what it is. Yeah. So interlocking log is a type of construction that is typically used in sort of southern European countries, nice and warm, don't need to worry about too much rain. And that's great, spike within, chap on, use your interlocking log. But in Scotland, typically when they're used, made out of terrible wood, eh, spruce, white wood, they will crack, split, piff, shake, they will contract, shrink, let wind in, let rain in, let everything in, and they're not fit for purpose in our country. Unless you're making an interlocking log building out of a hardwood, don't bother. So I did a review on what interlocking log is, and I called it Two Log Cabins, Interlocking Log Explained. And it's number one on Google, which is quite embarrassing because two it actually become number two, and also their paid ads are blighted by the fact that I've written a review of them, which is a bit of a shame. Next, for Google Snippet for loads of stuff, but this one's pretty cool. Google Snippet for the 
top summer house manufacturers in Scotland. Great. So I review other uh, summer house companies. We're not included because this is impartial, it's transparent and honest and for the customer's needs. So I review other summer house companies and I give an award to the best one in that block. Don't look at that. So I'm writing all this content and creating all these blogs and answering all these questions because this is going to help my customers make a buying decision quicker. So not only are they getting educated, but they're also going to do it quickly. So this is reducing the time it takes for me to engage with the leads to then get to sale. Okay, so simple strategy, works a charm. But what makes my blogs different is, my people used to say, you know, Cara, you've got a fantastic brand tone of voice. And I'd be like, what does that even mean? I'm like, thanks, thanks very much. What I meant, what I meant was is that I just don't give a shit. And then I write something that looks a bit like this. How to fucking work from home, because that's how I felt. One dreary, dreary, miserable January evening in 2017, I just sat down at the table, cracked open a bottle of wine, and with my teenage daughter in hand, we pegged out my day. My day of absolute mass destruction. Chaos, kids, cats, laundry, dishes, running a business, forget to put the fucking wheelie bit out. <laughs> All that sort of stuff went in there. The angst, the rage, the fury, everything that you have to put up on a daily strike just to get to work, just to do your job, and cleaning yourself a space in the kitchen table to do some emails at 11 o'clock at night or whatever. You all know it, you've all been there, we know what it's like. It's not fun. But what is fun is having a garden office. So instead of that, horrendous, chaotic life. You can just pop yourself into your garden office where everything is tranquil. There isn't a kid sock anywhere. There's no laundry. There's no half-eaten food. There's no cat piss. Just you and your beautiful garden office. The point of the article, okay? Always be closing. And so that's how I did it. And uh, unfortunately, what I didn't realize is I did it on LinkedIn. And not only are you not allowed to be female on LinkedIn, but you certainly aren't allowed to fucking swear. So it went total shit crazy mental uh, viral sensation, just totally took over the world. And I'm in the newspapers, I'm on the radio, I'm getting banned from LinkedIn, and my website is going through the roof. Because people want to know what this wife is all about. Who is this? How dare she come here on LinkedIn and swear at me? They want to know who I am, and it increases my website traffic by 440% in the course of two weeks where all this madness is going on. And whilst all that's going on, I'm selling garden offices, best year yet, 2017 will be remembered for that year. The trolls are amazing, by the way, so even if you don't go and read the article, Go and just read the comments, the trolls, honest to God, what fun we had. I had messages from friends that were just going to the bed early at night, the glass of wine, just to check the comments, find out what the trolls were saying, and look at the replies. Such good fun. So we're now, let's talk about video. Video's hard, really hard, okay? So we've got all means of different communication online. We can do it by blog, by text. We can do it by video, we can do it by audio. People consume in different ways. And what we do know is that over 80% of the content consumed online today is video. So if your business is not doing video, then it's very unlikely that they're even being seen. Video was important, and I started back in 2016 17, and it took me about 200 takes and three hours to get over the fact that I've got a squint nose and my voice is so annoying. So annoying. So video in that in that retrospect, I totally get it. I understand everybody cringes, nobody wants to do it. I don't want to be on camera. Get over yourself. Your customers don't care if you've got a squint nose. 
care if you've got an annoying voice, but they don't care about your swindles. They don't care what you look like. They want the answer to the question. So I got over myself and I did a hundred videos. That's when my challenge was. I hired myself a video editor, set up a tripod, plugged in my iPhone. You don't need any advance for this shit, by the way. Filmed myself and I think I did 47 videos in one afternoon. Bam, 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 just bash them out. Let's go, ready. And now I've got a YouTube channel that's got over over 200 videos on it, no, 100 videos on YouTube. Yeah, over 100 videos on YouTube. And I get ridiculous view counts of like 20,000 people want to know if they should insulate their summer house. Who are these people? That's insane. So video's good, it's cool. It's bringing another concept forward for our customers to be able to get the answers to the questions that they need. It makes it easier, it breaks down the barriers, it helps them along their buying journey process. And this all equates to what, oh that's my YouTube channel, yeah. you can subscribe by the way, subscribe. This all equates to how the, the customers make their buying decision. Now this guy is called Stephen Marshall. Stephen Marshall is a legend of a man. He's probably what I would describe as my best customer persona. So if you've got to do those types of things in your business where you've got to work out who is buying your stuff, he's my guy for buying my stuff. Stephen Marshall sent me an email and asked me about um, garden rooms back in 2017 December time and he said to me um, something like this. Oh, you can't read it. Shit, sorry. Right. Hi, Hannah. I've now had some time to properly measure up the site and take some photos to give you a closer view of it. What he's talking about is the five page PDF that you attach to this email, by the way. I've also figured out the size and layout as well as what I've been looking for in terms of fixtures and fittings and finish. All in the attached five page PDF. Hopefully, the dimensions I've opted for are workable and they make the best use of the space to accommodate the garden office. I hope I've provided a clear enough description of what I think I'm after. Now the last sentence reads, now this is important and I want you to pay attention to the last sentence. However, if you need any more information, need to clarify something or suggest some changes, please feel free to get in touch. I look forward to hearing back from you. What does that sentence sound like? Does any of you think that sentence is a little bit familiar? Anybody in sales in this room right now? By show of hands. Sales, what is that? Got in. <laughs> what does that sentence sound like? No? So it sounds like something that you might say? I look forward to hearing from you. If you have any more questions, please feel free to get back to me. What has Stephen Marshall just done? What has he just done? Does anyone know? Sorry? Stephen Marshall has sold himself a £35,000 garden room. Five page PDF with every single question I could possibly need the answer to in order to place an order for him is in that document. He has basically written his own order for himself and sent it to me by email and then asked if I could be any more help. Sorry, asked if he could be any more help for me. He's asking me. What's my mind? It's a beautiful day. It was a beautiful day. And it told me that what I was doing was working. And this is what, it, what we call assignment selling. So assignment selling is the process of intentionally using the information that you have created via text, video or audio, that is educational about your product and or service with the purpose to resolving the major concerns and questions of prospects. So they are dramatically more prepared for sales, for a sales appointment. Okay, so we want all this content to be given to the client before they get anywhere near us. Because not only does it educate them into what they want, 
it also teaches them what we want. So instead of us having to deal with customers that we don't want, that aren't willing to pay for our services, or don't understand our values or culture or whatever, we don't have to deal with those people because they've already excluded themselves from the running when they've read our assignment selling package. I call it the buyer's pick guide, and every customer gets one. And anybody can download it from our website, and they can understand through the basis of all my content what they get from the list in the can. So when people come into my office, what they say is, you're a lot taller in real life. I want to buy a shed. That's it, that's all they say. You take their order and it's done. They don't have to do anything. I want a lengthy process which would normally involve site visits, numerous conversations, and updated emails, turns into one conversation where both people fully understand their own obligation. It's just great, isn't it? Fantastic, great story, doing all this content, creating this new vision for our family business, driving it forward, pushing it out, getting there. Fantastic. Money's looking good. Everyone's happy, right? Who doesn't want a 20-something managing director of a company that you've been working for, I don't know, the best part of 15 years? The same person, he used to cut the boots and make the coffee. Now we're in charge and telling you what to do. Who would want that? It sounds like great. So Gillis and Mackay, up until 2015, they were paying for yellow pages and BT ads. They were paying for Google ads. They were paying for local newspaper ads. They relied on word of mouth. Since 2015, they haven't paid for any of those things. Not one pence. I went all in with content and it was something that I truly believed was going to push our business into the realms of where it needed to be recognised. Somewhere where we could proudly stand and say we make the best sheds in the world and this is why. But unfortunately, like those things that we talked about earlier, those feelings, it wasn't reciprocated. I had the worst case of resistance you have ever seen. Not only did they not want to help me with my content, they didn't even want to speak to me. They didn't want anything to do with me. Terrified in case I tried to put a camera in front of them. They hated me. They talked about me. They made me feel shit. And all the while, I was just wondering, why am I a cool boss? Why would you go, why, why do you want to do what I want to do? Is this not good fun? This is not what we're about. No, we didn't. So I had to change opinions and I had to think of something fast. I wanted to get out of this stagnant area that was causing such rife and upset and disgust and bleh. So I put on a course called Thrive. It's basically cognitive behavior therapy. If anybody's familiar with it. But it's clever, it works and uh, I was trying to change the attitudes of the team and get them to work collectively together and see things from a positive nature and understand that the only thing that they really have any control over is their own mind and actions. That's why I want them to see. But did they want to see that? No. After the six week course, I followed up with the course leader, expecting him to tell me all the progressive things I could do with Gillis McKay to get these guys back in the game. Turned up and like, it's going to tell me, you know, what their true feelings are, their innate core beliefs, and what they want from their job, and I'm going to give it to them. No, he told me that basically my staff fucking hate me. They don't want anything to do with me. They think uh, they've got massive doubt about what I want for the business and where I want to take it. They have fear, distrust. Yeah, they hate me. Oh God, I was absolutely gutted. You would they believe? I mean, I didn't cry easy, but I bawled my fucking eyes out in the car, just sobbing away. If anybody walked past, I mean, God knows, but I was honest to God, heartbroken. These people have raised me. I've worked with them since I was 12 years old. I 
I trusted them. So I phoned Chris, the man responsible for all this bastard. And I said, I just don't understand where I can go from here. I don't want to go back. Ask me, I'm out. I can't do it. I can't turn up every day and have these people just hate me all the time. Shit. And Chris said to me, Karen, you're not one of them. You can't be part of the team. You're not the team, Kara. You're the fucking leader. What am I supposed to do with that? Nobody wants me to be their leader. He goes, so it doesn't matter. You're alone now. You're on your own. You've got to do this. You've got to show them that you are still turning up every day. Go in. You earn that trust. You earn that respect. You keep going. There's Chris. He gave me a baby. Oops. So that's what I did. It is... 2019, so two years on from that moment, and a lot has changed, baby being one. But also, my brothers have left the business, two of them. And my office manager, also out of the business, we know why. So, staff turnaround makes a big difference. New bloods, new emotions, new feelings, new hierarchy. The change has happened. Because regardless of all the things we've talked about, all the negative feelings, all the hurt, all the fear, anxiety, distrust, vulnerability, resentment, resistance, doesn't matter. Change happens anyway. Because Gillis and Mackay are doing the right thing. I am doing the right thing. I know I'm doing the right thing. I feel it. I understand it. And the money tells me I'm doing the right thing. Since before I became the managing director of Gillis Mackay, there was no growth. There was sustainability. And in fact, most winters, we had to lay people off. I've completely eradicated the need for that. I've changed the entire system of our business where we actually shut down from December through to February, and put everybody into the workshops so you don't have to work in the shittiest of weathers and you're on stock build. And I can afford that because I know how to work money and I know how to sell shits. So now I have the trust. Now I have the belief. Because change happens anyway. So what I'm asking of you guys right now, today, is in the realms of your business, how you go to work, how you behave, in the realms of at home, how you communicate with your loved ones. When you are facing change and you feel like that person is impacting you with their change strategy, whatever you want to call it, you're starting to get a bit fearful, a bit worried. Think about it. Think about your actions that you're in control of. There's one person that's pretty important to me in my life, and his name is Marcus Aurelius. He's a stoic, and it's something that I practice every day, and it helps me see things better. It helps me uh, get clarity on what I am in control of and what I'm not. And the one thing uh, that I take with me in, all, in, in every situation, whether it's dealing with the children, the partner, my ex-partner, my business, whatever, in any situation, I always understand that the harder it is, the more worth it's doing. So the obstacle is always the way. And in this, the impediment of action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. When you see a challenge that you resist, or resent, see that challenge as the way and get through it. Is there something out of all of us here today that you can relate to right now that you're going through, whether it's in your personal or your business, where change is happening? That you resist or shy away from? 
Can anybody relate to something like that? It might be a, uh, maybe a shitty relationship with your mum or something personal like that. Or it might just be a new layout to the office. Somebody's moved the phone. Just anything where there's some sort of change that's impacting you in a negative way. If you can hold on to that just now, and I'm going to ask you, do you think it's possible that you can change the way that you behave in order to progress more positively in that circumstance? By a show of hands, how many of us here think that they could change the way that they're behaving right now to make that situation more positive and progressive? By a show of hands. Here. Nothing. No. You all good? You're good. Good lad. That's me, team. How am I? I have no idea if I've run over what time it is. Cheers.